Hello and welcome to Business on the Wire. I'm Mithali Mukachi. Schools across India have been shut for a year and a half now in the wake of the COVID pandemic. What it has left is inequitable scars and hard, hard hit to children who were already struggling with both numeracy and reading skills. A recent survey indicates and points to just that. The School Children's Online and Offline Learning Survey School that was led by Dr. John Dres found that children in rural India and of course amongst the urban poor had been hit extremely hard, had taken several steps back in terms of the learning skills that they had achieved and were now in a precarious position in terms of the academic skills that they still held on to. Their parents are desperate for schools to reopen and for their children to get a better chance at learning and of course a better life. Joining me to talk about the takeaways of that survey and what it points to across many of these uh, uh, interest groups or pockets is Dr. Jean Dress. Thank you, Dr. Dress, for joining me and speaking with me. Um, you know, I wanted to start with some of the nuts and bolts of your survey and what you found, specifically with what your observations were when you conducted um, your reading tests or your numeracy tests across these 15 states and union territories. What is it that came across? Right. So let me first explain a little bit about the survey. It's called the school survey. School stands for School Children's Online and Offline Learning Survey. And it was conducted in 16 states and union territories, most of the states of North India, but also other states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Assam, and so on. And it was a survey in the best tradition of what we call hard work, no pay. So it was done entirely by unpaid volunteers who worked out of enthusiasm. So what we did is in early August, we circulated an appeal for volunteers to participate in this survey. And we had responses from all over the country, including these uh, 15 states. And basically we trained them online and we gave them simple instructions about how to identify underprivileged neighborhoods in rural areas and urban areas, like for example, uh, informal bastis in urban areas and small hamlets inhabited by marginalized communities in rural areas. So it is explicitly a survey focusing on the poorer and more marginalized communities. That's important to understand, to interpret the results. Uh, we should discuss the reading test, but I think before that, it's important to see what I regard as the more important part of the survey, which is to bring out how most of these children have been abandoned by the schooling system for the last 18 months, which is an extraordinarily long time. Uh, the government placed its faith in online education, but for these children, online education, you can forget. I mean, we found that in rural areas, only 8% of the children we interviewed, there were 1,400 households in the survey, and we interviewed one child in each household, enrolled in class, uh, in primary or upper primary class. So uh, only 8% of the children in rural areas were studying online regularly. And it's not because they don't have smartphones. I mean, half of these children actually lived in a household with a smartphone, but there are so many other hurdles. You know, the smartphone has to be available to the child. They have to have connectivity. They have to have money for recharge. The school has to send online material. They have to understand the material. They have to have the ability to concentrate. They may not have the right environment. There are so many reasons why online education basically is out of reach for poor children. That's number one. And the other part, which I, for me, was really a revelation is how little has been done for what we call the offline children, those who are not able to study online, which is the majority in these communities. In many states, like in Jharkhand, where I live, uh, the teachers have not been given any specific instructions to do anything, anything for these children. In some states like Maharashtra, for example, Karnataka, some effort was made, for example, in the form of giving them homework. But judging from the results of the reading test, which you mentioned, we will, we will come to, uh, these efforts have really not been very effective. So de facto, in large parts of the country, these offline children, which is the majority of poor children, have been abandoned by the schooling system. And the results are really catastrophic, not just in terms of the learning levels, but also in terms of the overall uh, emotional, psych you know, social, psychological, and nutritional well-being of these children. 
Um, let's talk then about, you know, your findings. And if I may sort of add a, a sub question to that, which is context, you know, it's an open secret, uh, Dr. Dress, that this is this has been one of our biggest failures, what we've done on education. Uh, you yes. know, where were we at? And where have we gotten to when, when you conducted this survey and, and conducted numeracy or reading tests? Yes, so I think you are right that there's a larger failure in the field of school education, which goes back uh, much earlier than this particular crisis and goes back, in fact, for the last 70 years or even before that. I mean, India has a long tradition of uh, the majority of children being excluded from the schooling system. And so it was very important, I think, once India became independent to try to build a schooling system that is inclusive and fair and helps to address the multiple inequalities of Indian society. And instead of that, we have created a schooling system that replicates and sometimes even reinforces these inequalities. I don't think most people in India realize how pathological the schooling system is how stratified compared to schooling systems in most other countries in the world. You know, in many countries, there's basically one schooling system of relatively even quality with most children going to uh, government schools or private non-profit schools. But here we have a whole uh, layered system with uh, government schools, private non-profit schools, private profit schools, and then multiple layers within each system. So that's what we started with two years ago with very uneven, schooling opportunities and of course extreme inequalities in education and achievements and now we have this crisis which has reinforced the inequalities because some of the more privileged children were able by and large to continue studying through online education at home they were able to sit in the comfort and safety of, of their homes and by and large continue studying and meanwhile the underprivileged children as i said were more or less abandoned and not only have they been unable to continue studying. But uh, as the survey shows quite dramatically, many of them have forgotten whatever little they had learned earlier. So that really magnifies the inequalities tremendously. So I think it's time that we, we wake up to the injustice that has been done to Indian children and particularly to underprivileged children, Dalit, Adivasi, poor uh, children. And uh, the schools, I feel, really must reopen now. There's no argument at all at this time for keeping the schools, or for that matter, the uh, child care center, the Anganadis closed. So it's time to reopen and also to think about how to reopen, not only in terms of health safety, but also in terms of the kind of curriculum and pedagogy that will make it possible uh, for these children to continue studying successfully in spite of the enormous gap that happened in between. Um, you know, I want to talk in much more depth about your observations when you conducted the survey for the scheduled uh, tribe and scheduled caste community. But um, I'm going back to some takeaways from your survey where you say over a third of children right up to class four. So we're talking about a child who's anywhere between nine to 11 years old, could only read a few letters and could not read a few words or sentences in their own language. I mean, I I'm just trying to sort of emphasize the enormity of what we've got, got going here, right. that 11 year old child who can't read one right. sentence straight. Right. In fact, if you look at grade three, where most children should be able to read fluently, uh, we found that in rural areas, only 25% were able to read more than a few words. I mean, that's absolutely catastrophic. It's much worse than what happened before. You know, you can make comparisons with the population census, with the National Family Health Survey, with the ASA surveys, whatever baseline you take, it's clear that it's much worse now, especially for those children like these great three children who de facto have never really been to school. I mean, they were in school briefly before the lockdown. Uh, and then for the year and a half now, they have been out of school. So you can imagine that how much they remember whatever little they learned earlier. And that's why 75% of them now are unable to read a few words. So there is a real risk, in fact, more, in fact, more than a risk, of a resurgence of mass illiteracy among children, unless something is done urgently. And the danger now is that, and by the way, we are talking of literacy because it's relatively, relatively measurable. And also because, of course, it is very important in its own right. I mean, literacy is important for so many things. It's not just, for, not just as a springboard of further education, but also for health, for participation in society for uh, 
being able to inform oneself through the media and so many other things for participation in democracy. So literacy is very important, but it's not, of course, the whole of education and education or formal education is not the only purpose of a school either. Literacy is useful because we are able, uh, he in this case, to measure it to some extent and get an idea of what's happening. But I think what is happening is not just about literacy, it's about the the, the all round development of the child is being affected. The learning, uh, the, uh, uh, the health of children, their nutrition, uh, their in urban areas, especially, I think there's also a lot of uh, psychological damage. So I think this is what we need to wake up to now. And we cannot just, you know, if we just reopen the schools and go back to normal, I think many of these children will never be able to really uh, get back to normal learning, normal involvement in the schooling system, and the damage will be permanent. And that's a fear that uh, that you probably heard echoed amongst their parents as well, was it not, Dr. Dres? I mean, absolutely. Know, so, amongst the urban rich, yeah. uh, there, there were fears of a wave three, but your own findings indicate that a majority of parents, particularly the offline mode learning, as you said, were really keen on schools reopening and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in, uh, in the rural areas, it was almost universal. I mean, parents even asked us, why are you asking this question? I mean, obviously, we want, to, <laughs> so we want the schools to reopen. It's, it was pretty obvious from their point of view. I should also mention that many of them feel that there's some kind of conspiracy against them. Not, not you know, conspiracy is a strong word. Uh, not that there's an explicit conspiracy, but there's a kind of plot. And I think... Um, there's some, there's an element of truth in that. Not that anyone is conspiring to uh, keep the schools closed as long as possible, but I think there's a kind of plot of passivity. You know, there's a, an extreme manifestation today of a long-standing lack of commitment to school education and to children in general. I think the lack of commitment to children has been particularly dra dramatic. Uh, with the current central government in the last seven years. For example, there have been two rounds of budget cuts for child-related programs, one in 2015 and one in 2021. And the cumulative impact of these budget cuts has been really amazing, I mean, like 40% you know, reduction in real terms in the case of ICDS. Uh, so I think it's extreme now, but it goes back much before that. And I think parents of these underprivileged children, they feel that, they feel that uh, they are being left out and that it's not an accident uh, that some people may not even want them to be educated or in any case do not give much importance to, to, that, to their education. I think that is a big factor to understand what is happening today because otherwise it's almost inexplicable. It cannot be explained by the health concerns. Mm. Uh, the other reality of a post-COVID world, Dr. Dres, is its deeply inequitous nature. And, uh, you know, that's, that's played out everywhere. And it seems to have played out over here as well, where your findings suggest that for children from scheduled castes and tribes, 55% of that community didn't have access to a smartphone against 38% uh, from other communities. 4% of children from the marginalized uh, community were studying online regularly. You know, uh, right. what does regularly mean? Does it mean a couple of hours? Does it mean five days a week? I'm just trying to understand how how little or how much they were able to glean at all in the last 18 months? So regularly <clears throat> is not uh, strictly defined. Basically, we ask people, for example, in the case of online education, we, we ask, uh, you know, does your child uh, study online? And if yes, does it, you know, is it regularly, is it kabi kabi or is it every day? That sort of distinction. So it's a broad distinction. Okay. You know, all these indicators are approximate uh, also because the sample is not particularly scientific. So they, they give us indications of what is happening. So when we say 8% of children were not studying online regularly, uh, we don't, we're not asking the public to accept that as a scientific estimate yeah. of that proportion. We are just giving, you know, illustration yeah, of the situation. We are basically, we are basically saying that for these interviews children and, uh, you know, online education doesn't really serve the purpose at all. You do have uh, an effective literacy rate, though, that, you know, your survey does point to for these children. And that, again, is uh, it's frankly distressing for children from the SC and ST community between 10 to 14 has 
caved in to 61% versus 77% for the others. Right. So all the indicators uh, are worse, in fact, quite a lot worse in many cases for uh, Dalit and Adivasi children compared to other children, even within these underprivileged communities. So whether you look at access to online education, whether you look at the results of the reading test, whether you look at the parents' satisfaction with uh, the online material when they do get it, I mean, almost any indicator, it, it is much worse. And that's why I said that uh, the, uh, what we call the lockout, <laughs> the fact that children have been locked out of school for a year and a half has amplified education and inequalities that were already extreme to start with by international standards. You know, I want to go back to a comment you made earlier where you said that uh, you can't just open the schools and, and get them back in. Um, it, it can't, right. uh, you know, return to zero sum so, and start <clears throat> from there. And in that context, it's, uh, it, you know, it boggles the mind to see that a child who is in grade three now jumps two grades and reaches grade five. A child who couldn't right. a sentence in their own language is now dealing with foreign languages uh, like, like English or Sanskrit. That's right. So let's take an example of a child who was in grade two before the lockdown. Yeah. Uh, before, because, because they were from underprivileged communities, they might have actually uh, achieved learning levels that you would not normally expect in uh, grade one. And now even that they have largely forgotten, you know, so they have to start more or less from scratch now, but they are being promoted to class four where they are given textbooks in the case of Jharkhand in not only English, but also Sanskrit. And in fact, in Jharkhand it's worse than that because the teachers now are going to be busy with election duties for the Gram Panchayat elections for the next few months. And by the time that is over, the children will be promoted one more grade, you know, so the child at class two child who should really be starting from scratch now is going to be catapulted to, to grade five next April. Now, I feel, you know, that, I mean, and either you take drastic steps to simplify the curriculum, to have a new kind of pedagogy, to make it possible for these children to get back on track, or you give them more time. I mean, you could, I mean, I'm not an educationist. I don't want to uh, give any specific advice on this, but as a lay person, I would say, why can't a child in that situation be given time until April next year to complete the grade in which they are enrolled today? You know, that is not, uh, that would not be a violation of the Right to Education Act. The, the Right to Education Act says that the child uh, should not be held back or detained, right? But that is, but if you give all children more time, to uh, catch up with the grade they are enrolled in, I don't think that we'll be detaining them. So that's not the issue. I think we have to do something or the other. You know, either you simplify the curriculum, you change the ped pedagogy to make it possible to, for children to continue in the grades they are enrolled in now, or you give them more time, give them more time. But to go back to square one without anything serious being done other than some, than some symbolic short-term bridge courses, for example, in Jharkhand, when I, ask the block education officer in the area where we, we were doing the survey, what is going to happen when the schools reopen? He said, we are going to um, mobilize volunteer teachers to give you know, extra instructions, ex instruction outside of school hours while the teachers continue with the curriculum. Now, this is very strange. And these volunteer teachers are not, not even going to be trained. So that kind of symbolic action, I think will not serve the purpose at all. We need something much more drastic. I'm not an educationist, so I don't myself understand very well how this situation can be handled. But I think we have to realize the gravity of the situation as it is, even in ordinary times. Yeah. There's a tremendous disconnect between the curriculum and the learning levels of disadvantaged children. Now this has been magnified to absurd proportions. So unless something really radical is done, I think, huge numbers of children are going to be de facto dropouts, even if they are still nominally enrolled for a while. So I think it's really time we face that and think of the issue of school, school reopening, not just in terms of health safeguards, of course, the health safeguards are also important, but also in terms of changes in curriculum and pedagogy that will make the system uh, more friendly for disadvantaged children in particular. Mm. Uh 
you know, I, I read a really beautiful quote by an educationist, Dr. Drez, about this reopening of schools, where she said that when schools reopen, we don't criticize the children for what they've lost. We meet them where they are. I think that's, you know, the, the simplest sort of stepping stone of, of, of trying to resolve this. Yes, um, absolutely. Even, even yeah. anecdotally for you, when you were looking at uh, your readings across states, were there states that seemed to have been hit harder than others in terms of what the children have lost? So the sample size is not large enough to make uh, detailed interstate comparisons. So I don't want to go into that too much. Okay. There is a bro broad contrast between what you might call the passive states and the active states. Like passive states are states like Jharkhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Assam, where, as I said earlier, very little has been done, if anything, for these offline children. And then there are states where at least some effort has been made, like Maharashtra and Karnataka, to some extent, perhaps Rajasthan also, where some effort was made to reach out to them. And it's possible that uh, the, uh, this contrast is also reflected in the learning levels, but we can't really look at that in any detail with a relatively small survey of this kind. Mm. There are some other takeaways though, where you observe that 26% of the households had switched from private to government schools for lack of right. funds. Uh, and yeah. midday meals had been discontinued across right. all the sample schools, all of them. I mean, right. um, yeah. <laughs> it uh, defies logic yeah. where midday meals are, I think, you know, a fulcrum force of uh, keeping these children engaged. It's a great way to, uh, you know, pass on nutrition and uh, general well-being right. for these children. Right. So uh, the transition from private schools to government schools that has been observed earlier by a number of studies. So we know that there has been a migration from private school to government schools, largely because people are unable to pay the fees and the other costs, including now that might include the cost of a smartphone or a recharge and so on. Um, and also because some private schools tried to cope with the crisis by switching to online and then making new impositions on the parents that the parents don't uh, uh, want to go with, especially if online education doesn't work anyway for their children. So there has been, in, in our sample, among the uh, about 20% of children who were enrolled in private schools before the lockout, about 26% of those children have migrated now to government schools. That, by the way, magnifies the challenges of reopening schools because, you know, it means that also you have to also cope with more children. Uh, by the way, I should also have mentioned that among other aspects of the unpreparedness of the system, uh, especially in states like Jharkhand, is the fact that the school premises are in such disastrous shape. I mean, the buildings have not been looked after now for 18 months. Uh, the toilets are almost all falling apart, the seepage and so on and so forth. And it's not a small amount of money that would, that would be required to put these buildings back into shape. So in every respect, there's a lack of preparedness and of efforts to uh, prepare for the reopening of schools. About midday meals, you're right. Basically, they have been discontinued, not only in schools, but also in Anganwadis across the country for the last, for the best of the last 18 months. Um, many states have arranged delivery of food grain, like rice or wheat, as a substitute for midday meals to families. And we did find that most families had received some food grain, but they are supposed to also receive cash on top of that. Uh, so the what is called the conversion cost, the, the cash costs, or midday meals over and above the food grain uh, that is used for buying vegetables and for fuel and so on and so forth. That was supposed to be given to the parents, but there's no system to do that. So in many states for a while, it was done by distributing cash to the parents, but uh, now the central government is, is insisting in doing it through the DBT payment system. And that, will, that takes a very long time to put in place. I mean, it's a very complicated system based on other and so on and so forth. And so uh, in Jharkhand, for example, there has been no distribution of cash since September 2020, because the teachers are running around trying to collect children's other numbers and opening their bank accounts and basically uh, making the system ready for DBT transfers. That is going to go on for a while. And I don't think it's ever going to happen uh, before the schools reopen. So the parents have been shortchanged in that respect also. 
you write uh, or you wrote in the Indian Express a couple of weeks back, uh, pointing to the union budget that you were talking about earlier, saying the finance minister blissfully reduced the budget to the Department of School Education by 10% or so, even as the union budget as a whole was increased by 15%. To this day, the central government persists with its delusional faith in online education. Uh, right. Why, why is it that nobody seems to be giving a damn about this section, Professor? I mean, generally, as, as we were discussing, you know, there's always been uh, a greater thrust on higher education and technical education. But uh, this time, it, it's almost like these children don't exist. Yes. So I think it's partly a reflection of this long tradition of education being seen as a privilege of a minority, in particular the upper castes. And uh, I think it's also a reflection of the character of Indian democracy. I mean, for people like you and me, the democratic institutions work very well. You know, the court system works well, the media system work well, works well, we can vote with proper information, we can maybe even contest elections, all this is fine. But for a large majority of people, these institutions work in a completely different and sometimes diamet diametrically opposite way. And so they are not really part of public discussion and they are out of focus. Uh, even for me, I mean, before I went to some of these villages in Jharkhand and looked at the schools for myself uh, in early August, I was not fully aware. I was vaguely aware that there was a problem, but not fully aware of the extent of the problem. So these people, and especially children, of course, because children are twice removed. I mean, they belong to underprivileged families that don't have a voice in the first place, and then they don't have a voice themselves within the family. So they're completely out of focus, and uh, it's a constant struggle to try to put these issues on the agenda of public policy and public discussions. Mm. Um, did, did you get a sense of how uh, this was disaggregated? So if I can complete, uh, so, yeah, so, so the, see, the other aspect of it is this kind of elitist uh, outlook of public policy in general and education policy in particular. I mean, the way the lockout has been handled, basically it was all geared to the privileged children. Uh, this uh, faith in online education, it worked quite all right for a certain section of children. And the resistance to schools opening again comes from this same section of privileged parents who uh, are quite all right with online education and would prefer the schools to continue being closed for the time being. And similarly, this uh, delusional faith in online education, which incidentally, incidentally was very well expressed by the prime minister himself one day after the release of our report, where he made some glowing statements about the success of online education and how it had saved the day during the lockdown. I mean, that is just another symptom of how essentially the Indian elite is living in its own world. And uh, probably from their point of view, things are quite fine and they're not seeing or not willing to see what is happening to uh, marginalized sections. Not willing to see, I think, is <laughs> perhaps the better way to put it. Um, the question I was asking was whether you had any uh, disaggregated data for gender, because that's been an observation in, in the urban poor, at least, that that one smartphone tends to go to the male student or the boy student in the house and not to the girl student. Okay, so uh, we haven't looked at that in detail so far. What The report that has been released so far is what we call an emergency report. So it was like done within a few days of the survey being completed. So we wanted to bring out the main results and basically the catastrophic nature of the situation. Uh, there were no striking gender contrast that came out from the initial analysis. For example, if you look at uh, uh, incidents of child labor, of course, the girls are doing much more domestic work as you would expect. But uh, if you look at paid labor, it's more or less the same. We found about 8% of children interviewed had done some paid uh, wage labor in the preceding three months, which by the way is quite high. I mean, 8% is really uh, abnormally high. So, uh, but that was the more or less the same for girls and boys. So, so but you know, we, we will be doing much more detailed analysis for the full report and we'll look more in more detail at the gender contrast also. Mm. Uh just one final question to you, Dr. Drez. You know, I was reading a paper that you wrote in, in 99, I think, on school participation in rural India. Uh, you know, and so many of those takeaways are 
it's almost like it's playing out in loop at this point. Um, you know, you talk about the strong intergenerational effects of schooling, how children, how, how parents who've gone to school encourage their kids to go to school, the positive effect of uh, an educated mother on the daughter going to school, the importance of midday schemes, um, and overall bias against the scheduled caste children. You've, you've looked at this for so many, so many decades now. Do you get the sense that this last year and a half has pushed us back very, very many steps and it's, it's going to be difficult to fill this gap? I think it has certainly pushed us back unless something drastic is done now. I think now this is the time to wake up and to see that we need, we need really unusual measure to deal with the situation. Otherwise, yes, it is going to leave a lasting mark and these children, especially the ones in the lower grades now in grades one, two, three, to some extent, even up to five, uh, who have been abandoned and are now not able to cope with the system uh, unless we do something drastic for them and not just for a few months, I think it will take a few years. Uh, then there's going to be a lasting impact uh, for certainly for these children. And uh, the schooling it's system itself, you know, I wouldn't say that it has been destroyed by the lockout. It's not like that. But I would say that it's a good time now to open our eyes to the deficiencies and pathologies of the schooling system and try to do something to put it on a better footing. Because this has been one of the biggest failures in India since independence is a failure. You know, 70 years uh, is not a short time to make it possible for all children to have decent education, at least up to you know, class eight or class 10. And I think in that respect, India has dramatically failed. Some states have done much better than others. You know, there are states like Kerala that have a long-standing commitment to education. And then after independence, Tamil Nadu and later on Himachal Pradesh also gave a lot of importance to elementary education. And they are now reaping the benefits of that in many different ways. Whether, you know, we look at all their social indicators, they are way ahead of most other states. So uh, I think we have to, see that a big mistake has been made all this time and that we have a lot to do to catch up. Perhaps the first and most important step would be an admission of the problem. Um, Absolutely. That's, that's Absolutely. Has been, has been lacking. Thank you. In so fact, the, the, mo the most extraordinary situation, sorry, <laughs> maybe I'm repeating myself, but just like way of concluding point, I think the most extraordinary part of this entire situation is how little it was talked about for so long until a few weeks ago, there was no discussion and not even much awareness of what was going on. And now we are suddenly waking up to this, and uh, we have a lot to a lot to do to make up for this this neglect. Yeah, no, you're right. I think even that reset has come once uh, urban middle class and upper class India is now ready to go back to school. That's when the conversation has has really opened up. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and all your insight. Thank you for taking the time out and chatting. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.